And we're live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to GSM Live. This is our second podcast that we're doing, and we finally kind of finalized the time. So we will be live every other Sunday from 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a little less than two hours, right? And today I'm super excited to welcome FLC as our guest. I'm Melissa Acid Sunshine. I'm joined by Dr. Prodigy and Little Sound DJ. How are you guys tonight? I'm good. A little tired. <laughs> yeah. A little sleepy too, but uh, everything all said and done is good. Nice. Awesome. Glad to hear it. I love the uh, picture you're using for FLC over there. <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 that's what I was laughing about. It's a throwback. It was too small too, so it's just all like totally blown up and over like <laughs> over pixelated. It's perfect. That's what it's it normally so looks like. What are you talking about? Totally. I mean, we have Kermit in our midst. So welcome, FLC. We're super happy to have you today. And it's great to be let's here. See. Yay! And you're on a totally different time zone than us, so it's like completely... It's 9 a.m. <laughs> it's bright and early. All right. Uh, I thought it was so going to be yeah. even worse than that. Not bad. Happy no, Monday. no. Happy well, Monday to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to jump right in and first go over a GSM event that just ended yesterday, GSM Grand Prix. We did our grand final, our final um, event yesterday for our first Grand Prix event, which happened over two months. So we're going to like talk about some of the thoughts on the tournament. But for those of you guys who missed it, we did end the tournament with a thousand dollar prize pool. A lot of it donated by you guys in the community. So thank you so much for all of your support. It was humbling and absolutely wonderful to receive that from you guys crack and paradise took home first place back squids were second and ft win were third crack and paradise took home 600 us dollars so that's pretty awesome what do you guys think uh i think it's crazy how we hit exactly a thousand dollars it was kind of <laughs> weird <laughs> yeah some uh familiar faces that like to support other tournament series uh showed up to uh support with our own uh prize pool so that was really cool and grateful to see that um i think hopefully in the next one we'll be able to even get some more so that'd be pretty pretty fortunate i think yeah uh we'll, we'll, we'll get into it later but i think um there was a lot of positive feedback about it so i'm i'm, I'm hopeful for that totally yeah i mean i kind of i think i kind of forgot about the finals up until like it was already happening and i just saw all the all the fireworks on twitter about it and then yeah the um I, it's actually amazing to me that just how much uh, generosity there is in the in the community to raise these prize pools. I know, um, like it's sort of become a bit of a thing where we're sort of crowdfunding, crowdfunding these prize pools, and it's really good to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, DJ, you were there yesterday. How do you feel about it? Uh, I'm just glad it didn't crash and burn. Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's I think that's the reaction whenever there's a big tournament and like the TOs afterwards are just like thank goodness it didn't <laughs> explode. <laughs> well, the one thing is I was I was sure that the tournament was gonna go fine. It was just like you, you know until until Trevor was like hey I'm gonna do the broadcast I was like oh crap oh crap. <laughs> <laughs> but no it went it went great. Yeah. All right. So jumping right into that, when's our next one? Yeah, uh, don't know yet. <laughs> I mean, we discussed kind of a tentative timeline of the summer, maybe between SNS five and between summer splat. So it would be, you know, a good amount of time when everybody's off from school to really devote to this kind of event that allows you to compete on multiple days to find your standings within the finals. So it's a little bit of a different system than a lot of other tournaments run on. Yep, I would say the one for sure thing is definitely not till after Beacon. Mm -hmm. No, we're gonna uh, do we're gonna yeah, do one right, right now. Starting right, start it up, start it up again, boys. Let's go. Surprise! Yeah. Oh no way! Way too much to do for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking of that, what kind of feedback did you want to discuss? You said you know, Praji, you had some really good feedback you want to go over. Yeah. So um, there's a I, the plus one server is kind of been a little bit active recently, mainly new memes popping up on twitter but for those that don't know plus one is just kind of like a, a server for pickup uh players it's like a pickup scrim server of players that typically kind of compete towards uh the top of the uh, top of the western scene basically 
and uh, we had most of the teams from Plus One, like their actual teams competing, and a lot of them had really positive things to say. And I also got a chance to talk to some people um, that were doing well in the series but didn't make top cut. They all had really positive things to say. Um, so I think people really enjoyed the format, which was cool because it was a completely different format. We haven't, the scene hasn't really ever had a chance to try out before. Um, and with the set play, people were kind of against set play at first at the beginning of it because they didn't really understand it. But then as they got a chance to experience it, once we made a little changes here and there, um, I got a lot of positive feedback about the set play as well. And how people said like, this is actually kind of, I kind of prefer this over like the regular stuff that they normally do. So that was also really, really cool to, to hear. Um, and it's, it's just exciting because like you get, it's so easy to get stuck in the road of just like, okay, best of fives, best of threes, single limb, double limb, done. You know, Swiss, Swiss pools, done. Like, all right, tournaments made, let's, let's do this. But if you really put some thought into it and really think about how unique Splatoon is as an experience and you try to cater to that experience, you can really come up with some pretty cool ideas. So that's, it's really satisfying from a, from a, TO perspective. It was a lot of fun from a player perspective. And I hope that uh, we kind of continue to share this and people get, you know, more people get a chance to experience what it's like. The fun little anecdote the idea for set play came off of a conversation between me and FLC back uh, in yes. Splat <laughs> One and like the third really? month yes. of the game. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna actually go there because, um, yeah. Like this, there were two big things for me in uh, in this tournament, and one of them was the set play. The other one was also like the sort of gradual qualifiers, rather than like just doing a big thing of Swiss groups. Um, but yeah, like I've been wanting to see um, the set play thing literally since before Splatoon One came out. Like it was, uh, I think back then it was um, I was sort of thinking about how to uh, play off some of the things that Counter Strike Global Offensive, uh, the way that works where like each round in the game is like 30 rounds in a game in regulation time in a, in a CSGO match. And so each time you play a round, um, you have to adapt to what the other team is doing as you're going. And one thing I thought that Splatoon 2 could really benefit from even back then was, oh, Splatoon 1, sorry, not Splatoon 2, but still Splatoon 2, um, was... If you could have that kind of thing where you've you play against a team on smart zones and then like they bring out some comp that you weren't prepared for and then like but it's okay because you're in a set you can actually switch and adapt to what they're doing and then they have a chance to do the same back. Um, but yeah, so like seeing that like obviously this isn't the first time the GSM's used that's the the set play format. I think he used it for some of the lands as well. Right. Um, this is but, the first time they were counterpicking modes and maps on it. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was like, it, it's, it's just really good to see that like people are um, taking to it and like actually starting to plan out like, okay, here's what we do if we lose the first game kind of thing. Um, and yeah, the second thing, the, the other thing that I wanted to bring up was the, the qualifiers, I think, are really... Because, uh, Prodigy, you mentioned the, um, the like Swiss groups, for example, going into, into a knockout bracket. Yep. And... One thing that I've noticed with a lot of the um, a lot of tournaments that have that kind of system is that like the Swiss groups can drag on for hours and hours and hours, and then mm -hmm. after they're done, you've got to go straight into your knockout bracket a lot of the time. Or maybe like they'll do that, and then the next day is the knockout bracket, and it's sort of with with all the delays in like a Swiss bracket because obviously each round has to be synced up and all that sort of stuff. It's it can get kind of it just feels like it drags on, and then like you finally get into the games that actually matter, and you just sort of gone cold, or you've uh, you've sort of burned out a little bit, and you're like, damn. Um, and then then you sort of feel like you could have done a whole lot better, but you didn't. But then with this, you've got the the early qualifiers like beforehand that you know you you qualify and get into the top cut, and then you can prepare for the top cut like over a, over a couple of weeks. So. That was something I really, really liked to see, and I think uh, most of the I think the teams in, in this tournament really benefited from it. It was yeah. kind of cool too, because like uh, FT Win, they didn't get to play until the third qualifier, and they just like they qualified just because of how well they did on that one, and ended up getting third in the finals. So it was kind of a neat storyline for them from their perspective too. Yeah, I agree. And then the only other thing I would add is that we still had to try to for the qualifiers, we still had to use 
the you know Swiss into a top cut. But we tried to limit it after we kind of we kind of adapted from the first one and we went to a playoff three, which is similar to BNS. BNS does playoff four. We originally wanted to do playoff four, but honestly, after kind of playing in the playoff three, I felt like that was actually a better experience because of how fast we got through the Swiss groups. And got to, and also because our top cut is a top sixteen rather than a top eight, at least that's how we formatted it this time. So I still felt like teams got a chance to play quite a quite a bunch while not while also not dragging it out dragging it out a lot. Um, you know, it was I think every tournament for the qualifiers was like five and a half hours or less max, which isn't bad on a, on a Saturday for how many teams are playing. Yeah, the first one so, went a little longer because of that initial delay, but. Right, yeah. we had we had some Smash G. Uh, the issues. second and third were <laughs> flawless as a tournament, <laughs> um, literally flawless, very unbiased. <laughs> yes, very unbiased. Um, I, I give Future the credit for that, anyway. So who cares? Future Future did a ton of work. For us. <laughs> Thank you very much, Future. Um, and then some of the, I guess I get negative feedback that we've kind of taken in, into account that we're going to address for the ones upcoming um mainly some of the stuff is like um uh, we actually made we actually already made the adaptation but adding the counter picking of the mode originally when it had, had set it set up um we decided the modes for each round for set play but it was suggested that you should be able to counter pick the mode if you if you and if you lose the first one so we just made splat zones the first mode the team that lost splat zones got to counter pick the mode um we still made it so um the first map was determined for each mode, so that way you couldn't counterpick the mode and the map because we felt like that might be too big of an advantage, uh, kind of transitioning from one one mode to the next. Um, so I think it just goes to show that, like you know, we're we're still willing to listen to what people have to say and how we can make this better because ultimately that's what we care about. Yeah, I think the other big feedback thing that we were told was that the graphics just like weren't jiving they weren't looking as good so that's totally on me i'm gonna take all that feedback in if you guys have anything specific that you want to see you know I'm, I'm gonna revise it work on it and we'll just have like a really better more solid system working for the next time we run it mm -hmm. yeah considering this was like a, a first run through this kind of format and all that i i think if the worst thing that people had to say was the graphics weren't uh quite as good as they were hoping then that's a pretty good sign i think and this was the first time i've done like a full graphics package for something like this because i did summer splat but trevor helped so much with that this was mostly like hey here's what it should look like go and i was like oh <laughs> so you know i have a little bit stronger of a handle on it now um and then the other thing that we kind of skipped over a little bit is that uh came out with the help with some other people made a really fantastic uh, data sheet for the, the film. Um, I'm trying to get a link-friendly version of it, because we have, we have, the, we have like the, the Google Docs drive, but there's also a tiny URL, but you can't copy and paste the tiny URL from the Google sheet, so I'm going to ask him to get the tiny URL for uh -oh. it real quick. But we're going to... You can? It won't let me copy and paste it. I can't, I can't select it. Anyway, I'm going to ping him and be like, hey, Give me the give me the link friendly version of it, and we're gonna share that in the chat. But he did that with the help with, um, uh, I think Gambin Wumi. Yeah, yeah, I, I can never I can never pronounce her name. I'm so sorry, but <laughs> Gambin Wumi, who has done fantastic work, uh, collecting massive amounts of data from the Japanese tournaments. So big props <laughs> to them because we didn't even ask them; they just did it. Kbot tried to post it in chat oh. and then got destroyed. <laughs> got destroyed. <laughs> Yeah, direct. Wait, how do I type it in? Yeah, so I guess like if we want to, do we want to actually like talk about the how people were counter picking, or is that? Yeah, the thing, that, the biggest thing that I pulled from it is, at least for the last like that last day, like um, there wasn't a mode that was like far and ahead more picked than the others. Like Clam Blitz had a little less than the others, but. Mm -hmm. But not um, as much but as not, they would have not like way less. So it was pretty yeah. interesting. It was also interesting because you gotta take into account what teams made it the furthest, right? Because um back squids, I think they always counterpicked tower control, right? Yeah. Uh, let's see. So yeah, they had they had a fifty four percent win rate in tower control. I'm not sure 
if you traded if you traded back squids for ghost and placements, I think clam blitz would have tr just essentially traded with it because right because ghost was counter picking clam blitz. I think every time too, and, and back squids was kind of picking tower control. So um, it's really interesting to see kind of those fluctuations. Um, interestingly, rainmaker, the, one of the modes that people love to hate on was kind of higher up. So there's also interesting to see that. And you can't even say that's about deep blues because we only played two blame matches Marsh. in the wash. So <laughs> you can't even you can't even blame us for that. There's other teams counterfeiting Rainmaker too. So. I think FTW is picking it a lot too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, it's interesting to see. Yeah, I think the most interesting thing for me is um just the way the way I'm expecting this this kind of counterpicking thing to to evolve as teams sort of make their strategies a bit, strategies a bit more fine grained is that uh, at the moment you mentioned the the counterpicks thing and I, if I look at this this sheet here it looks like the counterpicks on the modes are fairly good like you've got back squids ft win and ghost all over fifty percent like they picked a mode that they knew that they could do better on mm -hmm. um, but the map counterpicks seem to be more like comfort picks um, like they're picking the maps just because they feel like they don't like the other ones as much or something like that rather than actually being like okay we want to pick um we want to pick a uh, pavilion rainmaker because we have this one strat that gets a super high score and we know how to defend it and all that sort of stuff um because like if i look at the the uh, counter picks it looks as though it's mostly comfort picks like it's mostly uh maps that teams sort of feel feel comfortable on like they play it the map play out fairly standardly all that sort of stuff um especially like like you feel like a rainmaker anchovy for example like not being picked at all and then you've got like main stage and skipper which they're not they're not amazing rainmaker maps as far as most people are concerned but like compared to the other ones that are being that are in the pool um so yeah I, I i i'm really looking forward to seeing if teams can um go from just being like okay we're back squids we're good on tower control to we're back squids we're also good on this particular map um and yeah and then the last thing I want to add is just make sure everyone checks out the tabs at the bottom too, because there's a tab for match summaries, which goes into detail of all the different sets, what maps are played, the scores, all that wonderful, good stuff. And uh, so just make sure there's a lot of in more in detailed uh, stuff to see from those tabs down there. Um, so really useful stuff. Once again, we didn't even ask them to do this. They just did it. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so amazing. much, everyone. Also, for the record, as a, since I was a player, I did not make the map list. Just want to—I just since I was a player in the tournament, I, I did not touch the map. That, list. That's that is on me. I did the map list. I I took I did input from you know most of the GSM staff, but I was the one who who picked it. So blame me if you didn't like it. I think most people were pretty much okay with it though. So yeah, yeah. It looks like you just kind of struck out most of the Splat One maps as well as Albacore and Wahoo. Wahoo's <laughs> not that bad. Come on. Um, <laughs> so I, mean, I, I didn't hate on stuff. wahoo i was i was trying to limit it to like what i thought were the best of the best for certain game types and then like without trying to like and and also trying to make some overlap happen so like you know each one showed up as two different modes yep. so it wasn't just like a one-off and you never got to touch it again kind of thing but yeah there's definitely some changes i'll probably make for the future but um i'm overall kind of happy with how the map list played out over the course of the whole time whole grand prix not even just the finals yeah i think next time you'll humor me and put in mori towers right um over my dead body <laughs> <laughs> had to try <laughs> i'd put moray in before Schellendorf, but yeah <laughs> yeah no i don't want Schellendorf. <laughs> i'll i'll it's, agree with you on that yeah i mean since we're already on the topic it's like mori is not nearly as bad as it was in the first game but for me, it's like it's I don't think it's bad. bad, but I think there are better maps. Yeah, there's and, there's better yeah. things you can pick. Yeah, I 100 yeah. percent agree with that. I think I think Mori is actually quite good on. Um, I think zones and uh, clan blitz. Are the clans two that is I'd like the one on. that I'm like, oh, you know, it's kind of okay there. Yeah, I think yeah, clans because it's sort of zones. yeah, it sort of it sort of shrinks the map down. So the, like the the really bad part about it is like in Rainmaker, um, you can't defend like the last little bit because the bridge going up from the goal up to the useless part of the map over next to your spawn is like so high up and it's like you can't do anything from any other angle than just like straight feeding into the into the death trap that is in front of your goal <laughs> um 
and yeah, like this, this, you could go through all sorts of other stuff about that, but um, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So yeah, I think, uh, thank you so much future and Kendall who's hang doing other stuff today and DJ and our friends at, at gen game and at Aeon for, you know, taking care of us yesterday, doing all of the TO work that you guys did over the past two months and coming up with all this great, really awesome way to showcase some really high end Splatoon, which I think is what we kept seeing yesterday over and over again, especially with uh, some of those plays by Keo at the end there. So it was a lot of fun. And thank you to Walkie for coming out and uh, commentating with me on it yesterday too. So let's move on to the Inkling Open. Should I, um, should I even say anything oh here? <laughs> Let me let me start by anyone who's not familiar with it. Our top eight for the NA Inkling Open are what? Element R, Loki Splatoon, Ink Sigma, FTWIN, Team Upgrade, Demise, and Luminous C. Yeah, yep. I think uh, what is the uh, X STDS X STDX pickup thing? Yeah, uh, from the minus section, minus section, but GG's back basically. So. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's they, you know, that team's pretty much, I think, in my opinion, the favorite to to win it all. Still, um, it is interesting to see some of the other teams. Just like last year, there were a couple upsets um, that in the turf war round specifically. Um, we'll have to see how those upsets play out when we the other modes are played um, coming up here in a couple weeks. Um, what is it like March second? I think they play. Yeah, that right? sounds right I, to me. Yeah, sounds, of course yeah. I don't have that in my notes. Yeah, I think it's March second. Um, but you know, last year the teams that were able to make it in through turf didn't, you know, have the best uh, fortunes playing in the other modes. Hopefully, it'll change around. Unfortunately, one of those new teams is, or one of the teams that wasn't upset, Element R, does match against Watt, so that's going to be a really tough match. For them, the the against the X STDX members more or less. Um, the other team, Ink Sigma. Well, I think they'll be playing low key. I think that's a better chance to happen there personally, just because low key, a couple of their members aren't eligible to play because they're not within you the that continental babies. United States, Canada. Well, no, no, it's not actually because they're from South America. So oh, right, they're not right, they're right, not right, allowed right. to play because they're from from right. From yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, they, they do have a little bit of that going for them, Ink Sigma. But even then, Loki is still a strong team. They still have a bunch of good players. So They pretty much have to play with the G6 roster, right? Um, I think they have else? a sub. I think they have a sub. They got Killer. Um, oh, right. Yeah. From, I think he's from Latin America somewhere specifically. I'm not sure if he's still there. I don't know. I don't know. He used to be former teammates with Misa, I'm pretty sure, back on when... Uh, what was their team name? It was like... It's so more than enough that they can do it. Yeah, I I forget what their team name was called. It used to be like the their the colon the semicolon was like their logo and it was like Yaijem or something like that, hmm. or their team tag. Right. Anyway, so like there is a little bit of history there. Like they they had they have played with each other before, so you know it's a sub, but it's a sub that's like been around a little bit. Oh, and Killer used to be on Prophecy actually. I think. Okay. The then yeah. So there you go. Or at least play yeah, with like them the, a lot, I think. The interesting thing for me in this top eight is you've got a couple of teams here, like um, Element R, Ink Sigma, and Team Upgrade. To me, are uh, three teams that, um, like, they're definitely quite strong. I think Ink Sigma especially has benefited a lot from picking up Ross lately. Uh, Ross has been sort of floating around in the in the high levels of the game for a while, and I think it's I think he's finally got a team he can stick with. And um, but yeah, it's it's just interesting to me because it seems like. Uh, Element R, Ink Sigma, and, and Upgrade to me are the teams that are likely to use kind of they're trying to they're, they're most likely like game the turf war system I guess so they're, they're most likely to be using um, sort of planned out comps that uh, like that are specific to um, like each map or whatever to like make sure that they've got uh, all the little, little nuances I guess of turf war um, One counterpoint to that um, Ink Sigma dude hmm. did vanilla jet sculpture like every game, I think. <laughs> Not every game. That almost is unfortunate. Game. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> That's what I was saying. That weapon's bad. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, yeah <laughs> okay um it's, it works but, somehow i'm just saying i that, i don't get how they got away with that weapon I, it, it kind of makes sense to me as in turn i obviously i'd much prefer to see a, a custom jet if they're going to run that but at the same time it's like um i think uh the one of the one of the things with turf war and i think we we're sort of heading in this direction anyway so uh one of the things with turf war is like the way it plays out is quite different from most of the other modes like each Contrary to what most people say about, oh, the only the last 30 seconds are all that matters, it's almost the opposite problem, where everything that you do from the very beginning of the game matters a ton. Like, you need to have your base painted, like, in the first 45 seconds, otherwise you have a big problem. You need to have, um, you know, you, you need to focus on the sides of the map, the parts of the map that aren't as important, um, making sure that they're completely covered, because you want to sort of split the enemy team's attention toward the end of the game, so that they go, like, one way or the other. Like, they either take the part of the map that's painted your color, or they go to the important part of the map that's actually going to count, like, 20-30% toward the total at the end. Like, all that sort of stuff sort of builds on, on top of itself. And this is why, when you have these kinds of, like, weird comps, like, I don't know, uh, Kenza Midian Jet Squelcher, like, that's when having sort of that extra turf coverage and all that, and, like, knowing where to go and, and how to plan out where you're going to uh, push into the, in the middle parts of the game, um, is the sort of thing that can really get upsets um, in uh, in these in, in like the first part. Obviously, it's not top eight. It, top eight is ranked instead of turf. But like, this is the sort of thing that would get uh, result in upsets if um, for for like what was it? Ink Sigma, I think, uh, took out Deep, uh, Deep Blues and another pickup that was particularly strong. So yeah, yeah. that's that's just sort of what I'm where I'm going with the. Uh, tough little thing. Uh, my counterpoint to that, I know we're going to get, like, like I guess we're already kind of transitioned to the Turf War stuff, but yeah. um, I think Turf War does have more of a competitive viability than a lot of people like to give it credit for. Um, and I think actually from this latest round of US Open, I think there's been actually a little bit of a shift in some of the top players kind of saying that actually maybe Turf War isn't that bad, at least publicly saying that. Privately, a lot of them would say like Turf War really isn't that bad, but they still don't want to play it. Um, for me personally, as a as a player, it's one of those things where it's like ultimately, yeah, the last thirty seconds do matter the most. But as I also said, like there is a lot more that goes into it. It's just that it's one of those things where it's like if you really do wipe in the last thirty seconds, it's like nine times out of ten, unless you have like everything else completely covered, you're pretty much gonna gonna lose. It's it's. It, it's very 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 difficult and it, and so from a balance standpoint that just doesn't seem that much fun but at the same time it's not like there's other weaknesses in other modes like there's the gg ray as people call it and like tower control there's nothing more boring than seeing a team who's about to make a comeback in the last 10 seconds of the game have to just wipe because they have to stack on top of the tower while the other team that's winning just uses a ray from base and they're completely safe like there's there are other weaknesses in other modes let's, let's be real here so it's one of those things that I'm not, I wouldn't necessarily be opposed if there was like more tournaments that involved her for, but at the same time, I still don't think it's the most balanced. And even for example, as we're talking about Ink Sigma, I saw them, some of them tweet saying like, "Oh, we didn't even like practice for this. Like, way to go us." It's like, well, well, yeah, that does maybe perhaps show how well they did perform. That might also show how maybe the mode isn't the most balanced. So you know. I don't have a lot of research or data or numbers to like back all this up, of course, but it's just some some food for thought. I think one of the easiest ways to kind of mention that research and data that you're talking about is looking at Splatfest weekends, because when you don't have these other modes that you have available to play, top players who would normally be ranked are forced to play Turf War if they want to play Splatoon. So now you have this like totally different shift in dynamic because people are focusing more on the the objectives and on getting the splats that they need instead of actually playing turf war, which is just like covering the ground in ink. So I think that just looking at that, how so many people are very frustrated playing that during the Splatfest weekend and also looking at the teams that play it and 
succeed over and over again. And now we can see that so much easier when you go into the lobby and you see, you know, so-and-so won a 10 times or won a hundred times. And, you know, you're constantly seeing those same names. So you begin to look at this as, okay, well, you know, it, that's like one way to kind of showcase a little bit of the competitive nature when you have no other option of what to play. Mm -hmm. I could also look at Japanese tournaments too. Like Dynamon's Mm -hmm. won three out of four Koshins so far, something like that. Something like that. I think he's won all the the most consistent player I've ever seen in the game in all these tournaments. Yeah. Like he, like his consistency goes back to spot one as well. Like I think he was winning Koshins in spot one. Yeah. I think he won the first one, the third one, and the fourth one, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but somebody can correct me if I'm wrong there. But yeah, yeah, like, I think yeah. I think, I think there, if he lost there's the definitely second one, it would have been yeah. yeah. Like it's Sorry, it, go ahead. It, it would be a mistake to say that there's no skill in turf war. Like I'm I'll, even I'll admit that there's there's skill to turf war, but like, all right, I feel like I might go on a rant here, but I'm gonna try and rein it in a little. Um, <laughs> the the benefits are t- of turf war are not so glaringly huge that it outweighs the negatives as far as you know it puts so much like it basically puts so much emphasis on one mistake that if you make one mistake and lose the game even though you played the first like if even if it's not in the last 30 seconds you made the mistake early or something like that and then you went even in the last 30 seconds it's like one mistake decides the game in turf war more often than the other modes by a huge margin, in my opinion. Um, Do you think that that would be fixed if you added the extra two minutes to the clock? No. You if think that, that's that would make just that worse. the way it is? It would make it worse. Uh, it's just yeah, by it design make- that the mode just can't... Like, there's no way to fix it without changing the way the mode works, I think. I... Okay, so I'm, DJ and I have been arguing the final, final points of turf war literally since before Splatoon 1. Again, shout out to Squidboards. Um, <laughs> oh man, the Squidboards the, days. So, my, so like the, 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 the whole like losing at the very end thing, I think is only, it's only so obvious because the timer is the only way the, the game ends. If you go back to like Clan Blitz, right? If you screw up on Clan Blitz and wipe, like we were talking about like, Mori before and someone actually said that if you screw up on more clan blitz you instantly lose um like it's 100 to zero knockout just so quickly just because like the clam the basket is right there spawn camp super easy uh clams all over the place next to the basket all that sort of stuff all contributes to basically if you make one big mistake in clam blitz on more you lose um same thing can be said of uh black belly tower control People like to complain about that map. I actually don't think it's as bad as people say because people just sort of like to feed the half pipe for some reason and don't defend at the wrong places, but less said about that, the better. Point is that people like to that people have a big problem with the way that Black Belly, for example, snowballs out of control once you around the corner in on tower control. Uh Kelp Dome TC obviously had a big rework on tower control because of how snowbally the end of it was. Like there's all sorts of all sorts of stuff along those lines where each mode Aside from Splat Sands, but Splat Sands is a bit different because it's sort of like it's more about how well you can cheese it rather than how like one mm-hmm. mistake screwing you over. Um, but all these modes have ways to just instantly lose, right? And one of those things is that it's always it's not at the last thirty seconds. It is any time in the game you mm-hmm. can just instantly lose. Um, so with Turf War, for example, like yes, you can instantly lose by wiping the last 30 seconds but you're going into every single match knowing fully well that the last 30 seconds you need to not kill yourself um and if you go in and kill yourself at the last 30 seconds it's not the mode's fault it's your own fault right like yes obviously there's ways that the other team could stingray you or they could inkjet you or something like that but at the same time like there's all sorts of like you 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 know what you're getting into right and i look at like, as we just mentioned, Dynamon is the most consistent player in Koshian, and Koshian is 100% turf war against the very best teams in Japan. And Dynamon has won every single one of those but one. I think he's, I think he's even had the same team for the last two. Like, the consistency there is difficult to, like, even if we say, like, maybe he just takes it more seriously than these other teams, it's still very difficult to argue with the fact that he wins so consistently and his team wins so consistently. 
Um, I do agree with the notion that like, if you, it is possible for like things to go wrong in the last 30 seconds that like you prepared for, but it still just happened anyway, like a clutch ink jet double or something like that, that just makes you get run over. But I think the solution to that would be to have longer sets. So like best of five rather than best of three kind of thing. Hmm. Um, because that way you can average things out uh, over time. Yeah, I think so. even then, like the like the the thing that people were suggesting after that was to do group stages in tournaments, like you know, like as turf war instead. Just like and the better thing was like it would save a ton of time. And I'm sitting here it thinking would. like the only reason I would want to play the only way I'd be okay with playing turf war is if I played more games of it to make up for the fact that yeah. one mistake decides the game half the time. So I don't know. I don't. I don't really like that. Yeah, that's sort of where I was where I was kind of going with that is the I'm just looking at this this thing, uh this uh topic list in front of me and yeah, the turf war group stage thing. Like the reason Japan does flat zone so much is because it makes tournaments run fast. Like the first stages that the first like couple of rounds in, in Japanese tournaments are over in like five minutes each because they're just like two oh knockouts, two oh knockouts, two oh knockouts in spot zones. Mm -hmm. And of course everyone actually joins the lobby instantly, that's another yeah. thing. But, <laughs> and they do um, like all take notes. Limb too, so Yeah, yeah. So like Turf War is three minutes every time, no matter how good each team like no no matter how much of a mismatch there is in each team. Um like you could very easily do it in like Swiss, for example, where you actually have to sync up the rounds anyway. But in just a like a, a early bracket or like a, a round robin kind of thing, it's it just seems kind of weird to want to do turf for that specifically. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I'm a huge proponent of turf war, but like my kind of take on this is why I mean leaving nintendo's idea of this alone why is it so terrible to have a division between the ranked modes and turf war why do we need turf war in our tournaments why can't we just enjoy what we currently have and and continue to use turf war for what we do and i i i'm you know kendall would yell at me when i say this but i'm a casual splatoon player i want to play turf war <laughs> with my friends you know and i there's, have a great time there's doing nothing it. wrong with that like and I, I think there should be turf war tournaments like and I specifically and I, for it. Yeah. And I but, totally agree with you and we're on it, DJ. I just don't think the de facto <laughs> yeah. standard should change from what it is to yeah. to like I agree. cater to turf war cuz I just think like even like a lot of people hate on like tower control right now because like special charge stuff and whatever else, but I I even think like tower control at its worst is still better than the best turf war mode for a competitive from a competitive perspective for me at the very least. And I also don't think it's fun to watch, but that's probably me too. It's definitely a little more challenging to commentate on too. <laughs> it's like, what team's ahead? I can't yeah. tell. <laughs> Looks like they're in trouble. My my biggest thing, you know, when doing that BNS Turf War edition was, what? why didn't they paint that whole section of the map? They lost like 10% by not even painting. Nice. Just press X. It's not that hard. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, wait, yeah. pressing X gives you... A to like a decimal point percentage value that your team has. Man, how did I know that? Like I should have used that. <laughs> Come on. Anyway. I think uh. I think there's some inherent flaws that Turf War would need to do. Like as a game mode, Turf War would need to be addressed to like bring it up to par of some of the other modes. That being said, again, I still think it does have some merits, but I do agree that having Turf War tournaments, specifically Turf War tournaments, wouldn't be worse. All Wait, the people you know that Sorry, love it and want it, yeah, you were you cut out a little bit. Oh, I said it wouldn't be the worst thing. Ever. Yeah, it would be a good thing. Yeah, yeah, and it'd be good for all the yeah. people that love it and want to play it, and it won't force it upon all the people that hate it, like me. Yeah, yeah and I think, like, because my my perspective on it is like I had to bloody stu study the all the details on Turf War for the Australian uh, version of the um, Inkling Open last year, and. Pretty much by the end of it, I was like, I still don't like Turf War, <laughs> but I can see I can see the depth in it that I still don't like it for a bunch of other new uh, new reasons. Exactly. Um, but it was sort of like, if I were to go in to a tournament knowing that I was going to play a bunch of Turf War, I'd be sort of able to like handle that. But if I was going into a tournament expecting to play a bunch of Splat Zones and uh, and, and Tower Control and all that sort of stuff, I'd be like, 
and then suddenly I've got to play a set of turf war. It's like, like I don't want to do that. I mm-hmm. really don't want to have to. Yeah. It's a it's a completely different over. mindset. It's a completely different it way is. to approach it's the very game. Different, yeah. And it's it's very jarring, quite honest. Yep. Yeah. It, yeah. It's like it's a totally different game playing turf war than the other modes. Like, it's so different. Like, I I, I can't even fathom like how different it is because it's like you have you're, you're thinking about it from a clock perspective like almost entirely from the beginning of the game and if you, and if you don't think about the game that way you're you're gonna lose probably um whereas the other modes that's not really the case except for like some specific things where like you need to make an overtime push or whatever but you know it's yeah i think i think just how different it plays between the other modes is a good enough reason to keep it separate but not necessarily be nothing yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. All right, so let's kind of transition back to the NA Inkling Open for just a quick second. I want to know who's your top four. What does everybody think? You know, what do you what are you thinking about for this? Obviously, you know, we mentioned what is kind of the favorite twin. Who's going to round out the rest? Um, I'll go first. I think it's going to be what. I think it's going to be low key over Ink Sigma. I think is it FTW versus upgrade, right? Um, I think FTW would take that. And then the one upset that I have is I actually think Luminous C will be Demise. I think that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'd go with that too. I think um, my only thing would be maybe it depends on how what team upgrades. Call. I don't know who is actually playing for team upgrade. But I feel like their comp might be something that FT went like they have a sort of unconventional comp. I think they run a dynamo, for example. Yeah, that's um, square. And they have like a. Oh, I'm trying to think what other stuff they run. Buckets they like probably, buckets. Yeah, yeah. They I think out of all the teams, aside from Luminous Sea Demise, I think out of all the sort of underdog teams, so so to speak, um, I think they have the best chance of winning there game mm-hmm. and getting in a top four mm-hmm. um like it's, it's sort of an outside chance i'd say but i i still think like if if, if you know results come in and team upgrade beats ftp win then i would be like oh rather than what the hell yeah um, yeah yeah so for me it's like the demise luminous c thing it's like it's like a 55 45 type of thing and I, the only reason i give that is because demise hasn't been playing as much recently whereas luminous c has been really been grinding it mm-hmm. um yeah so that's like that's the only reason why i kind of have and those taken teams like back squids and i think what, what did they play ghost too and well oh, i just closed the tab but uh they don't think they played ghost yesterday it was cheap um, cheap squad cheap cheap, cheap but they, cheap. They, they, yeah they they beat cheap cheap one of the previous qualifiers so you know they're they're definitely they're competing yep they've they've beaten demise in el dorado <clears throat> tournament and some other stuff so like they're they're competing, and I think they've been grinding it out, whereas Demise didn't play in the GSM stuff at all. Um, and so it's just, just purely based off of activity and just seeing the drive. I think the Luminous C members are really motivated right now. Nice. All right, so it's going to be a fun time. So March 2nd is the next time we get to see any of these teams play. And then we all know that our top four does get to go to PAX East, which is in Boston on March 30th. 30th, I think. Yeah, Yeah, it's the weekend after Beacon! Exclamation Beacon in chat. I think it actually starts on a Thursday, too. So it's a little weird. Yes, yeah, it does. And I think the turf war is actually on... It's not on Sunday. It's on like the Saturday or the Turf War. Sorry, the Splatoon part of it is on the Saturday day, I not have no on idea. the Sunday, as far as I remember. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a whole lot of fun to see kind of where they go with this and what the next part of it's going to be. And, you know, we all get to cheer on our, our good friends playing in this. So the next topic I want to transition on to is talking about Nintendo's actual involvement with esports. So kind of Kendall had kind of come up with a lot of these topics and he couldn't be here for family reasons today. But his kind of bold question was, does Nintendo need to care more about esports? 
So is the open enough? Is there a need for Nintendo back to back Splatoon as an esport? And how can this directly affect us in the West? Because obviously we know that Nintendo has a little bit more um, input in what happens in Japan. Uh, do you think Nintendo will change their mindset? And kind of what what are your thoughts on this type of thing? I do have like something that relates to this that I'm going to bring up in a little while, but not quite yet. Um, if it, it really depends on what Nintendo wants, because if they want Splatoon to grow, then yes, I think they need to do more. But if they're happy with just selling the games every time they come up with a new one and whatever DLC they come out with, I don't think they really need to do anything. But as far as if the competitive scene goes, um, short of Splatoon 3, I don't see us growing like significantly bigger than we are now like we could grow a little bit over time but you know it 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 takes some sort of some something crazy for us to be like to grow into like a smash level esport without without nintendo's help yeah yeah i kind of have some thoughts about that it's you know we, we can we can certainly do it without nintendo like we can continue to survive without nintendo but if we really wanted to like really take that next big step whether it's nintendo or some other org like an mg type of thing that um that really is able to invest a serious amount of uh, straight up funding it's probably not it's it's just too difficult like everyone that does this stuff has other jobs that they do right like no one's able to like fully Nobody does full tune full time except for like a couple players yeah, and even then, it's like they're they're streamers. They're not like tournament yeah. organizers. They're not going out there looking for investment or funding because like that's not, you know, that's not how they're gonna survive. So you know they they have they have other stuff to do. So it's one of those things where it's like, I really 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 wish Nintendo would or somebody, um, but I I don't see it happening. Like this, I think this year was their chance. Like, Splatoon Two has been doing like super well um all across the world and they just if anything they might have even potentially downgraded it like now now we they haven't confirmed an e3 thing yet maybe that's still happening we don't know but at least here in na now it's actually like packs and, and now it's four teams instead of one so that's still really cool but but the prestige is lower pre- pre- yeah exactly the prestige arguably is a little bit lower so it's like at the very best the only thing i would settle for is it's the same certainly not an improvement so you know, that's... But we don't know, like, in terms of that, we're, like you said, they haven't confirmed anything. We don't know. They could still do something at E3 that could be a world championship. Yeah, right. at this point, at this point last year, they hadn't announced anything. I remember that because the Australian tournament was like, I think, I, I think Gabe can, Gabe's in chat, he can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure the E3 tournament was, like, announced almost the same time as the Australian finals. Like, we didn't know that the qualifiers for the Australian finals were... Got, like we didn't know during the qualifiers i think we might have known at the qualifiers okay um so the qualifiers were at the end of march last year so there's a fairly sizable um chance that we don't even know anything about an e3 tournament until like the end of march yeah um so like there's no and if and if that's the case if there is actually a tournament at e3 it means that they're almost expanding the support because that means that there's an actual in-person event for the na qualifiers instead of um yeah, just flying out one team yeah yeah so um, like i i would love to eat my words i really really would love to eat eat my own words. that's just from what we've seen so far yeah um so my my take on the nintendo esports thing is kind of it's it's kind of difficult because one thing that I think with esports is a big problem that the, the Splatoon community needs to avoid is the idea of I guess uh, I don't want to use the word toxic um, <laughs> but like uh, investment that we rely too much on. So mm-hmm. an example would be uh, let's say Nintendo pulls a Blizzard and throws like twenty million dollars at Splatoon. That investment <laughs> just completely I know. Just, you almost me. made me spit out my water. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. All right, continue. I'm glad, but yeah, y- y- you know what I'm saying, there, right? Like, if you if if Nintendo throws a whole bunch of money at Splatoon, and we don't have anything to sort of match that, 
uh, like anything on the same order of magnitude to even match that, then what happens is we become dependent on the Nintendo Nintendo's investment, right? Yep. Same thing is true of third party investors as well. This is why I'm not particularly fond of seeing teams get signed by random orgs because mm-hmm. they don't do anything. When Ghost comes in and sponsors uh, and sorry signs, uh, you know, Dude Sandow, Soren, Urza, and Brian, it's like they're getting three, four very popular streamers, all that sort of stuff. They're supporting them. There's a bit of to and fro in that. Both but sides if, are getting someone out of that. Yeah. Yes. So it's an actual beneficial kind of cooperation going on. Whereas if some organization comes out of nowhere and just throws ten, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars or something at, at Splatoon. It, like we suddenly are completely dependent on that investment and then they can like say we'll, we'll just pull out investment if we do anything that they don't like mm. um now i don't think nintendo would act in bad faith toward their own game but at the same time if nintendo just decides to pull the plug at some point maybe next year maybe two years down the track three years whatever then if we've been relying on that investment that's a problem uh, yep. because suddenly everything just comes to a halt um or they demand so, that every competitive tournament is turf war only. Yeah, that's the other sort of thing. Like because Nintendo, from what I understand, Nintendo is actually, especially with Smash, they're doing like a lot of behind the scenes stuff. So like they're showing up, there's they're sending representatives, I think it's out to G six. I remember there was talk about like Nintendo reps out there saying, Hey, here's the you know, here are your Splatoon here are your not Splatoon, your Smash setups. Um, we'll help you sort of run things in terms of like keeping track of the hardware, all that sort of stuff. Um but then they wanted G6 to actually be its own thing in terms of funding and, and, and prize pools and all that sort of stuff. I'm not 100% of the details on that, and this is just sort of a bit of hearsay. But that, to me, says that Nintendo wants their respective esports teams to sort of grow on their own merit and support in ways that, you know, just provide logistics support sort of thing, rather than actually throwing money at things. Um, and I... As much as it's painful to like, you know, try to scrounge money together to run a LAN or to um, like make a prize pool for an online tournament sort of thing, I do prefer, if we're interested in long term growth, I do prefer the sort of approach that Nintendo's taking now. I think we still have a bit of a problem in that if Nintendo suddenly decides to drop everything next year, like just only do a Smash Invitational or something next year, then that's basically it for us anyway so it's kind of like they, they, if they stop promoting splatoon then people stop buying the game as much and and, and so on mm-hmm. um but yeah it's it's difficult it's especially difficult to see them changing their mindset anytime soon like there's no way that they're gonna just suddenly start throwing money at the at the game i don't think it's there's any reason to expect them to do that so it's kind of we have to build our own thing and i think we've started taking the right steps to doing so like i think the crowdsourcing is the main way to handle that because then it's like a direct like it's direct support from the players to the players from the scene to the players to the yeah um and i think that's definitely the way that smaller scenes like ours need to be focusing on growing um rather than relying on some third party uh, investor to bail us out i think it also that that kind of branching off what you said reliant and how we become we i think if we had an investor like that we can become used to it that would begin to set the standard and then when the next event doesn't have that money behind it or doesn't have that investor behind it everybody doesn't want to go because they feel like it's not worth it anymore so Mm -hmm. i think that's also the other part to it that you know gets very dangerous if someone with that much money decides to come in sorry i cut you off dj no you're good um, th- I I would say the money thing I agree with, but that's only when it gets past a certain amount of money where it's like, you know, there's yes. no way yeah. we could raise that otherwise or get that yeah, some I, other way. I I specifically said like a an order of magnitude kind of problem where like if we there's no way match it, mm-hmm. and that's yeah. But yeah, go on. But yeah, like the the like, I definitely think Nintendo could do more to help things move along a little better, like. There's no reason, there's no real tangible reason that they couldn't tweet out about, you know, hey, there's BNS this week. Like, you know, yeah. if you have a team yeah. and you like Splatoon and you like 
you know, tower control, whatever mode it is that week, go sign up. Then we'd immediately get like 400 teams signing up for BS BNS every week. Like, mm -hmm. they don't do that kind of stuff. Like, they've helped pu publicize a couple lands here and there, but even that's kind of hard to get them to do. Um, like, I know that from experience. And, like, they definitely could be more forthcoming with doing that kind of stuff. Or, like, even little things like lending docs. I know they got, like, probably a warehouse full of docs that they could give out to events, and we'd have to, like, it would help out immensely if we didn't have to rely on people bringing docs and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, there, there's tangible ways that they could help that they currently, like, sort of do but don't really do. And, you know, if, if they did more of that, it, the scene would grow way faster than it does right now. Like, I think the biggest problem Splatoon, especially in the West, has is the general public doesn't really understand that there's something that happens. Like, that there, there's a competitive or esports scene to the game. Like, mm -hmm. people just don't Lately. know that that's a thing. Like, yes. Yeah. And... Yep. Without Nintendo's help on that, like, it's really on, you know, every individual, like, unless, unless everybody in the community, s like, started vote brigading every competitive post on Reddit and Facebook, <laughs> and, you know, like, there's no way for us to break that barrier quickly, so, yeah. I guess that's, what, that's the point I was trying to get to. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can definitely agree with that like i what i guess my take on that would be i completely agree with that the social the social media stuff like that is exactly what nintendo should be doing you know if they actually are committed to the idea of growing a grassroots scene that can sustain itself then that is the sort of thing that they can and should be doing to kind of um get the word out there because they're all like all the kinds of people who like nintendo versus uh would reach uh actual like people who are interested in Splatoon, casual players who want to get involved. Mm -hmm. um, so it is actual, they are grassroots people uh, in, a, in a sense. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely think that Nintendo, I agree that Nintendo should be doing that. I, like, even just like something bigger, like um, like if we had like one big tournament, like, you know, an SNS or whatever, and then and, nintendo put that in the news channel on the on the switch like click here to find out more info if you want to go to sns like just imagine like the response you'd get from that for yeah a tournament but that i we think do. that gets really really hard because now you have a 10 year old who says hey mom i want to go to this water park to hang out with splatoon people <laughs> and the parent is like who's going to be watching you and I think that's where Nintendo is like, we can't be responsible for promoting content that might cause some sort of situation. And I, I think that's the legal part of it, that it's not that they don't want to, because I'm sure they look at this and they get excited that so many of us are creating these events for their scene. But I think it's just the worry of how do we handle this legally if something were to arise and we're the ones who now push this on this child to, to handle it. You know? I don't know. I, I don't see how they're liable for any sort of like awareness thing. You know what I mean? The the thing that uh, I would see them being against is like, moment... you know, we don't have control over it. It's RIP, but we don't have control over that event, so we don't want to promote it on our platform without express control. You know what I mean? Like, I think yeah, it's more it's... about that and less about ten year olds asking their parents to go. Like, the parents like Nintendo. It, Nintendo. Yeah. Nintendo I... dots every I and crosses every T in terms of like <laughs> liability when it comes to kids. Like if you've looked at mm -hmm. any of the I, I think Pokemon VGC is the place to look for that to see just how much how many hoops they go through um to to make like just that tournament work. So like if they're if they're looking at it from the perspective of like, you know, having to handle another crop of kids like the same way they do Pokemon VGC than that, I could very easily see them getting a bit skittish out of, out of that. So, Because also you can look at just the games that they put out and they've added some sort of chat messaging feature. When was the last time Nintendo has released a game where you can type your own message? Yeah. Never. Splatoon 2. So Technically. You can type your own the message Meverse, Like the Meverse thing. thing. Okay, Meverse, but that's totally different. That's like Meverse because we had that with Wii U too. 
I mean, where you can literally reach to someone you are playing with or, you know, whatever you're talking about, directly say something to them. They are pre, pre-typed out messages, you know, taunts, I'm using tilt controls, whatever you want to call it, that that's always what they're going to do because... You know, were you holding up your phone? Let me let me pull up my Nintendo Switch Online app and uh, add you to private battle, so I can talk to you. One second, I gotta let me let me just do this real quick. And and how long did they actually take to like get that out there? And have you actually tried the service with voice chat? Oh like, God, no, of course. <laughs> it's horrible. It, it disconnects it's, it's and it bad. drops every ten seconds. I mean, I actually met like a whole group of friends on it last year when I started playing Splatoon. You know, it it's that was like my first discussion with these people. And yeah, it was it was just absolutely terrible when finally I was like, hey, this is my discord. Just add me on there. It's so much easier. Yeah. And I think that, you know, Nintendo all over their app, too. They talk about their legal, how they have no control over what anyone says to people. You know, you can block people. You can choose to turn off voice. All of these things that they're trying to give this opportunity for parents to say, hey, I don't want my kid talking with people and and the majority of us within this competitive scene are not children but you know like children like under 12 but i'm just saying that we really need to look at it from the legal point of view and i think that's the the major thought of where nintendo is looking at it and this is also something i've discussed my brother is a lawyer intellectual property works in new york city and this is something that he and i have discussed ad nauseum about entertainment law and how Nintendo just doesn't have the the patience to have to deal with something if there were to be some kind of issue here. And I, yeah, I honestly it's... think that's what it is. I think going back to the like, just I'm not a lawyer, but I'm if you go back to the example about like putting a thing on the news about the about Smash and Splash, let's say we go through this whole thing where like some kid eventually makes it out to Smash and Splash or whatever. And then there's something that happens, just whatever, you can insert insert crazy event here. And then the parents get on Nintendo and say, hey, my kid had a thing happen at Smash and Splash, um, and I'm suing you. And it's like, it doesn't, yeah. It, it doesn't even need to be a crazy event. Hey, my kid lost their Switch. Can you give him all of his save data back? Yeah. Sorry. And it's sort of, yeah, well, that's, that's the sort of thing, though, right? Is people will lose their minds over anything that happens. Right, and they will just go straight to Nintendo and say, "Nintendo, something happened. Make it right." And like, mm-hmm. even if they have no grounds whatsoever to do it, at the same time, Nintendo somehow has to deal with that, right? And that's sort of, uh, I think, what ends up what ends up happening a lot of the time. Um, it's the. Or it's, go ahead. No, no, no I, I was, I was, I was done. It's the caution. This cup contains hot contents that are hot, and you spill your coffee and you sue McDonald's. I mean. You I don't know. know. Like, I I look at other games out there, like non Nintendo stuff, and I don't see anybody that takes those like is so scared of dealing with the public that they can't promote <clears throat> can't promote their own community. Like, but that's sorry. that's just crazy to me. It's like I, absolutely crazy to me that that that's the way Nintendo like like who. Because cause I'm saying, like, Nintendo's specific target audience are the younger generation. So they are the ones that that's where they have to worry about the liability with the parents, with the children more so. When you look at these other games, look at a PlayStation, look at Xbox, look at the titles that they're promoting. I mean, it's generally towards an older audience. And that's where Nintendo really needs to be careful about what they're doing. I think I think that's the biggest part of it, because we can compare Nintendo to any giant company that does video games but at the end of the day nintendo is the only one that's coming out with tons of games on top of each other towards their younger audience and that's that's just like my i I do agree with dj it is kind of ridiculous that they don't i think it's short they still don't i no i agree with you guys i'm just arguing this point that this is like where they're coming from i wish they would sort of everything you know yeah it's it's sort of a devil's advocate thing like it's it sucks that nintendo does this because i'm sure there is some way they could make it work if they if they really wanted to and really tried but they're not trying um like the 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 sort of stuff that we're talking about now i think is what they're thinking about like the the kinds of you know we don't want to deal with this kind of liability stuff 
And the other thing is, um, I, I suspect to a degree some of the stuff with like Halo, COD, um, Fortnite, whatever the whatever else, all these other tournaments that might happen in in person. Um, like I don't even necessarily know that they do a whole lot of promotion for in person events that are, that are like open events. Um, no, online I was tournaments, just... yes. But the other yeah. thing is that like these 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 games, they can just point to the rating classification and say it's you know seventeen plus or fifteen plus or whatever. Like your More, kid is twelve. Any live right? event, yeah. they could just be like you must be sixteen plus to click this link. Yeah. Like why why is yeah, that? Yeah, I think. Thing? Yeah. Well, and that's what I'm saying. Like, there's there's all sorts of things they could do that they aren't doing, and I agree completely with that. But at the same time, like, if they're trying to be open to like letting kids play in some tournament or other, then it's also like with that comes crazy parents, and with crazy parents comes lots and lots of stupid lawsuits and crazy just phone calls and and just nightmares to deal with. So it's sort of at the very least, like, just letting all the third parties handle that is sort of it's okay. <laughs> the the one thing that I just want to add look, real quick is in the case of where, at least personally, that I have seen um, companies directly advertise for events, um, that company has always been involved with said event too. So in order for, and I think Nintendo would need to get on board with a LAN. If, if, if the example of promoting a LAN, I think they would need to be involved in actually planning of the land in itself comfortable enough to actually promote it too. And that, that would just be my guess based off of what I've seen. You're cutting out a lot. Uh, I think we got the gist of quiet. your, se- we, I think we got the gist of your yeah, sentence, I I but think, yeah, I know we lost anything too. It's just <clears> like every like three words, you're just like gone. Yeah. Okay. I think I was just talking <clears> too quiet, but I mean, yeah. like the, I mean, that's kind of what they're doing now, but they're like, you know, in order for us to even tweet that your thing exists, like we have to be, you know, yeah, directly involved, Indeed. and you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. Yeah, the, the helicopter parents, basically. Yeah, like, and that's not about they, liability stuff. That's about <laughs> them not wanting their IP to be skewed in a way that they don't like. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That that's what yeah. that's about. They, they they are very controlling on the way that their IP is presented, and you know, like the, like that's the Project M thing. Like they they will not touch something with Project M, like even like in the building. You know what I mean? Like yeah, it's just you know I, I don't know. I think it's more about how protective of the IP that the Japan like Nintendo Japan is specifically, um, than it is about. 11 worried about 11 year olds with moms that are overprotective like i think that oh yeah maybe a consideration for them but i think it's more about we don't want splatoon to be sponsored by weed maps or something like that yeah they they (laughs) they are very very controlling to the point where um at the australian event last year um the two commentators had like lab coats uh because one of them uh, toad seeley is a actual like he's a he's a researcher like a scientist mm-hmm. um so he had he just brought along mm-hmm. a couple of lab coats and he was going to do the he was they were going to do the um the squid researcher thing but they had to actually not do it even though like i think it was uh, esl who was organizing it so it wasn't even like nintendo obviously was was handling it but it was also like it, they, the the nintendo australia people were like hell yeah totally do that that's awesome and then like half an hour later they were like uh can't let you do that because nintendo japan doesn't like it so it's sort of like they they won't even let people cosplay as you know squid uh squid research lab people um for for a live stream like that's how protective they are so yeah it's definitely very 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 protective with that um with the even this even the weird stuff so unfortunate yeah hopefully if they let loose just a little bit it could grow so much bigger that, I guess that's need, the point. We just need to meet more people who work for Nintendo and have them <laughs> come to our side. <laughs> yeah. Let's just do that. Yeah. Why? Why did we think of that before? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really good at making friends, I promise. <laughs> I don't even know if we could that, that would even work because I feel like Nintendo Japan, like, 
put so much control on Nintendo of America, even like that specifically. It's like they can't do anything without Japan's say so kind of stuff. Like, mm-hmm. like if you know Miyamoto doesn't say okay, they can't you know do anything with Mario or whatever. So yeah, I don't know. That's that's a whole nother topic, but. All right, let's move on. Let's hope that somewhere down the line, maybe in the beginning of Splatoon 3, Nintendo decides <laughs> they want to back our grassroots scene. In the meantime, every org is going to continue to put on really great events that we're super proud of and want you guys to be a part of. So that being said, let's talk about some of the upcoming tournaments that we have going on here. First thing I want to mention is the Inkvitational, sponsored by Ink TV. You can find on all the information on Ink TV Splat their Twitter. And it's going to be on February 23rd and 24th. They're doing a prize pool that starts at $300 with donations during stream as they do for BNS. And they've invited 16 teams to compete. The first eight have been announced and they are Ghost Gaming, In Control Splatoon, FT Win, El Firmament, Demise, Fuller Ace, Cheap Cheap Squad, and Undecided. And tomorrow they're going to reveal the next top eight. Who are you guys thinking is going to be in this next eight? What are what are your thoughts here? I think we'll see a lot of familiar names. Okay, Prodigy, you can't answer this, I guess. <laughs> um, I mean, hmm. we're not. We're, I mean, no one's supposed to know. I don't. I don't know everyone that top or the, yeah. the not the next, but. Just guessing based off of what we've seen so far, probably a lot of familiar names. Yeah, I mean, I don't know who's in this next eight set, but I would love to see Loki there. You know, I think that they've been playing really, really well. It was a lot of fun to watch them yesterday. Back Squids did a really great job. That would be fun to see them too. So I mean, I'll be surprised if those big names don't make it. It's it's the ones towards like you know fifteenth, sixteenth plays in place in the eyes of uh ink tv whether like those are the question marks like i'll be surprised if certain ones don't get in but i'm not going to make any like major guesses but you know i i don't a world without low key in that is kind of strange to me but who knows mm-hmm. yeah i don't particularly follow like who's doing well in bns at the moment so i'm not a whole lot of help but it, i do notice that for example you know crack and paradise isn't on there Demise, low key. Um, I think, yeah, Luminous C is on there. I just. Uh, oh, sorry, Demise is. I had a typo, Mises. yeah. I, okay. I. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, they're there. Okay. Um, yeah, so, like, there's a bunch of teams that are definitely going to fill out the first four of that last eight. Um, in terms of the other teams, like, I wouldn't be surprised if, say, I don't know, maybe Ink Sigma gets a spot just because they've made uh, top eight at the. Um, NA event. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. Like, there's, there, there might be a couple of, I, I think, what was it, Element R and Team Upgrade as well could could squeeze in there just for, again, the same reason. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Yeah. I, I, I guess it depends on how long ago these teams were invited, though, too. Yeah, I think that's the true. teams have known true. for a while that they got in, I would imagine. Um, so I think things were probably decided at least... I mean, I don't know this. I don't have no insider info on this. I just assume that I assume that some right. of these decisions were made at least a couple of weeks ago. Like, I would have thought so as well. But at the same time, like, I, if that's if the time allowed, then that would be sort of where I'd be looking mm-hmm. for some extra extra names. Yeah. All right. It's going to be fun to watch no matter what. February 23rd and 24th. So moving on, we have our first EU Invitational that's going to be happening that the first, sorry, the first sponsored EU Invitational. I think this is kind of a major thing that we should talk about here. Sennheiser, is that how you say it? Sennheiser Gaming um, is actually sponsoring an Invitational for Splatoon March 16th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And it's going to be a really, really fun thing. Eight EU teams, they're doing dual language casting. So it's going to be cast in both French and English. And they're offering up 2000 to 2500 euro prize money. So this is kind of huge for our scene. It's huge for EU mm-hmm. scene. 
Yeah, I, I think, yes. But I, I mean, like... yeah, but I mean, EU scene, like we are connected enough with EU scene. It's still West. It's not Japan that EU can set this example and kind of continue to move forward. And maybe NA will pick it up from here. I don't think that's yeah, how it works, I mean, but <laughs> uh, with, with tournament with with tournament sponsorships, it could be depending on how much Sennheiser gets behind it. I'm expecting that the price it, it the the tweet says between two thousand and twenty five hundred euros worth of prizes. So I'm assuming that's actually more like they get a headset each if they win or something. Um, I, I wouldn't be. But at the same time, yeah. But at the same time, like this is the sort of thing that like. I would be wanting because touching back on what we were talking about earlier with like esports investment and whatnot, this is the sort of mm -hmm. thing that like is at least getting us started. Like it's this is something that isn't overwhelming our uh, side of things. And yeah, so it's I I, I think like <coughs> if they've got a good crop of teams, like they've got you know Ghost Gaming and Kraken Paradise and all them, then yeah, this could be like a really good way for. Do we um, know the teams that are playing? No. no, I don't think so. Not yet. I don't think so. No. no. There's still a it month. It just says soon. eight best European teams. So I, I do know that some teams have been contacted, but that's the length of my information. All right. And their trailer is very good at not showing any team member names of like players who are coming in. So it's not even like we even have like some hints here. The mm. thing I'm worried about with that is. It's okay. So the thing about the EU scene versus the NA scene is the NA scene is bigger as a whole, but EU scene probably at least for right now they have a lot of the better players. So like mm. like the gameplay is I'm sure going to be great. It's just if it's so EU focused, like are they going to get less viewers than they want because NA is not going to be interested? Like that that's the kind of thing I'm worried about with doing this EU only kind of thing. Or even if it was like an NA only thing with the same perspective because then you'd be missing out on some of the best teams, some of the most popular teams like Ghost and it's like you know I don't know. I I don't like I'm glad that there's someone kicking down the door on sponsored tournaments for Splatoon. Mm -hmm. um, props to Sennheiser for doing it. I'm just worried about the EU only thing, not because oh, man, I don't get to play, but more so it's just like, I, I wonder if because of the way they're doing it, they're going to get what they want out of it. Yeah, I mean, if, if they get Ghost Gaming in, then they're going to have, you know, how many hundred dude fans just chilling in the chat <laughs> talking about how good yeah. he is. That's, it's not even... It's uh, not well, even... I mean, seriously, when dude's playing, like, viewership jump, jumps up by like 100 to 200... <laughs> Dude, I know, like but specifically the mean mention of dude fan. <laughs> oh, it killed me. Does do anyway. dude's fans have a name? Like, I don't know. I don't know if they do. They should. It's, it's, just, it's so they, funny. It like, needs to be. Even, even on our own, own like GSM lands, like Beacon, it's like dude's team suddenly on, and it's just like, oh yeah, it's dude, finally. And then like when he's not playing, it's like, where's dude? It's, like, <laughs> yeah. it's great. He's the biggest personality in our community right now, I think. But yeah. Well, at least on Twitch, I, I would argue there might be some people that are are in power with him on YouTube, apparently. But the dude society overall. is that what it's called? But the dude like society, even then, like I, I feel like those people, like there's some people that are bigger than him on YouTube, but most of those people don't have the that viewership like yeah, following exactly. them everywhere they go. You know what I mean? I but, think a fair few of those are European as well, aren't they? Yes. Um, I think yeah. Like, isn't Watson pretty same. big and? Yep, Wadsom's got a decent following. Anyway, this is kind of a little bit of a that's a, a tangent. That's a whole other tangent. Yeah, I'm sorry. We'll <laughs> um, talk about Splatoon YouTube at some other time. <laughs> so, yes. my thoughts on this: I think it's really good. I think it's really cool that we got like a company like Sennheiser <laughs> that directly relates to an esports type of thing, um, sponsoring something like this. That's really cool. Um, their wording on a tweet makes the pricing sound a little vague so hopefully we get more details about that soon especially since it's kind of coming up relatively soon um less a than a month yeah. yeah so hopefully that gets kind of shared honestly the only thing that i don't like about the fact of it being eu only 
is that when NA tried to do a couple NA only stuff, like Vesper's uh, Ink Force stuff was being like continental United States only. Um, no one from Mexico, no one from Canada, no one from you. There was a lot of like outcry of just like, wow, I can't believe you would do that. Like we're, you know, a united community, the West is the West. Like, you know, why would, rah, 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 rah. People got, people got upset. And like, now there's this, a big, cool new thing. Sennheiser, a new sponsor that I've never seen before. Cool prizes. EU only. And it's just like, cool. It just, it just kind of accepted. It's just like, wait, 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 wait a second. Wait a second. How come, how come every, everyone else gets to be upset about like a week, like a Wednesday night Splat Zones only <laughs> tournament for US With only? no prize as far as I With know. With no prizes. Yeah. But now a big, a big European thing is announced. And everyone's just like, sweet. It's like, what? I don't know. For me, it's I like think. that's that's a little that's a little crappy. But like, yeah. all things considered, that's that's not like that's not like Sennheiser's fault, the organizers' fault, or anything like that. I think that's a little bit of like a community kind of like double standard there. Um, obviously, things have changed a little bit since Ink Force was around the first time because they've like technically there was like two rounds of Ink Forces. Um, so things have changed a little bit, but I don't know. That's that's just me calling out a little bit of hypocrisy. Yeah. I don't know. It sort of seems like. I didn't even know this tournament was a thing, so I wouldn't be surprised if people just don't even know about it. In order, I mean, to it only got announced what two fast. days ago or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So it was like, yeah, recently. Yeah. yeah. So it might have just flown under the radar, and people haven't gotten to like it, it happened two days ago, right? So it's sort of yeah. passed the statute, the statute of outrage, um, which I believe is about fifteen minutes. And <laughs> so. it only, it only has like. 96 likes 43 re retweets and 1.5k views so like in the grand scheme of things because it's so new not so many people have gotten their eyes on it just yet like who's who, who's like doing it you know what i mean like who's organizing players it? players unity is the organizer um they got a picture uh, of urza on there yeah Wow, and and like one of their so, previous tweets or something like that. So ghost confirmed is that what that means? <laughs> no, yeah, probably. Well, he's, he's he's not wearing a ghost jersey. It's just a picture of. Whether, yeah, because he was modeling for is. some of their other stuff. Um, oh yeah, that was like that was three days ago actually. Mm-hmm. Urza, Urza was a model today. I learned. Yeah. yeah. There you go. So, so yeah, the I fact mean... that like we don't know who is organizing it. Like there's. As far as we know, there's no pedigree there unless, you know, it's like, I guess I, I imagine like if it's anybody in EU, it's probably like leans involved or something like that. But right. Or the, or the esports bros, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or it might be esports potentially because but... e esports bros, are, are they French specifically? I, I can't remember. I think, yeah, they're French. So potentially yes. them. But yeah. But yeah, it's yeah. it sounds like. I, I don't know. There's a lot of question marks there. Yeah, um, it'll be fun to watch and a good thing to tune into. You know, it's it sounds like it could be a really fun day. Yeah, I mean, it's I'm going to I'm going to watch it for sure. So. Yeah. All yep. right. I just hope I just hope Sennheiser gets what they want out of it, not because. Well, I guess I, I don't know that I need to finish that thought, but it's more like. If they get what they want out of it, it opens the door for them, not even just them to do more, but other organiz or like other sponsors to be like, oh, okay, so they got something out of it, so we can do it mm -hmm. too. Or and like yeah. or yeah. some org that is currently doing things goes out and says, Hey, this happened over here. Let's make it happen like with you and us. Like like we can do it, we can do this too. Like, you know. There's definitely a lot of potential future stuff that could happen off the back of this if it goes well so I'm yeah. excited for it yes. yeah hear that sponsors gsm open for sponsorship <laughs> come sponsor our events i wasn't gonna go there but okay i mean chill anyway <laughs> <laughs> i believe we got so, a couple more to go over yeah so we have an, a couple of few a few more to do here so the next one that i want to talk about was summer breeze which is um the uk they're calling it uk's first major splatoon land june 22nd this looks so cool uh the tos are um does he go by dat gp dude baggage kitsune and dragonudo so people we recognize within the scene definitely like a lot of fun stuff that you know we'd be looking forward to i think i think this is huge it's 
sounds like so much fun. It's an awesome time to be out there, you know, in it's in it's in London. So it's a, probably the best time of year you'd ever want to go to London, June. So it's definitely going to be a really fun time. And I really want to go. <laughs> <laughs> yep. If it wasn't um, so close to SNS, I would probably try to go, actually. Mm-hmm. The other thing is that it is just a one day event. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's. For me personally, I like it when lands are two day events. Um, besides, like when we do our, like a Long Island splat locals, that makes sense to have them as like one day. It's that's a, a little yeah for locals. That, that's a little bit unfortunate, but obviously it's like as a, as a starting point to start to try to get more land events in Europe because that's what European players tell me all the time. It's like, oh well, we don't have any lands. Like, I is so lucky. It's like, okay, yeah, we're so lucky that we have lands, but we don't have Nintendo support like you guys do. They're like, oh yeah, true. Um, <laughs> Also, so, just organize the lands yourself, like what right, Dude, so that's Dude what I'm saying. This... Dragon Noodle, aka Kyle, are doing. <laughs> yeah. So it's one of those things where it's like I can understand that this one's like a one day thing. Hopefully, in the future, they're able to make it like two day, like weekend events. Um, but yeah, this is a good starting point. Hopefully, it goes off really well. Good luck to all of them organizing it. And uh, if anyone's in that area, they should definitely check it out. Yeah, I think it'll be really, really fun. And they're calling it a major, so I'm interested to see how this kind of evolves from here because registration is pretty inexpensive and it's, you know, like you said, it's only one day and they have a cap of 100 attendees. So I'm okay. really excited to see what happens here because to me, you'd kind of want a little bit larger of an audience, but maybe they're thinking that due to location and everything, it's just not as feasible for some of the other numbers that have been coming to to majors. I think it with the hundred cap and the one day thing, I think they're aiming at getting people within like three hours of wherever it is, like and getting everybody yeah. that is there to go. Mm -hmm. Um I don't think they're expecting people to be flying from you know North America or other parts of EU that yeah. are too far away that to like to go to this. I, I think the expectation is to be and like they're, it's a major, but they want it to be a local, a local major, a regional, it, mm -hmm. in Smash a regional. terms, a regional. Yeah. The venue yeah, looks really cool, by the way. Yeah, it does. It does. It's really, really cool. Yeah, from what I know about the UK scene, it's fairly, fairly tight knit. Like, there's a, I know, like before Splatoon two came out, like they had a huge event. Like Nintendo UK actually put on a big event for like all the Splatoon players in the UK, like the the actual. Um, I think they do like sm small stuff regularly. Okay. Yeah, and they and they, they do tons of stuff. Like I I know that um, what's his name? The commentator on Bowie, I think his name is. I think he was actually at AGDQ, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but like I, I keep seeing like I follow him on Twitter. He keeps posting all sorts of stuff about UK stuff. So yeah, it's uh, it's cool to um, to see that sort of finally getting a proper LAN event going. That um, sort of growing like showing that they've been growing a bit um and yeah like i think like for the european lands thing it seems so strange to me because like i've always i've always thought of, like the 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 french scene has always been like the scene where like there's just a ton of random splatoon players in paris just sort of getting around like playing against each other at, at locals and all that sort of stuff and to hear that, that that's they're not like a, a special that snowflake that they don't make any sense anywhere else but yeah, so because like that's how it was in Mario Kart was like the French scene in Mario Kart was like huge in the sort of local stuff. Uh, but anyway, I don't know. It's gonna be fun to watch, and we'll see how it evolves from here. Hopefully, this isn't the first that you know happens within the UK. And I mean, I'm if really it's excited. them and RSL doing stuff in Europe, that's that's a good thing. Mm hmm. Yeah. All right, moving on, the next kind of tournament that I want to touch upon announced just today, and this kind of a little personal to me, is the next Fresh Start Cup, which is going to be on March 2nd and 3rd. And that will be um, hosted by Gen Game. So, you know, we all we all love them, obviously. And I absolutely love this because this is something near and dear to my heart. I think that new teams need Wait, an opportunity. Gen Game or End Game? It's the it's part fresh star cup is part of the splatoon amateur circuit which is hosted that the circuit is hosted by endgame okay the actual broadcast will be on gen game gotcha. so it's a little confusing sorry um but it 
you know, I think that it's a really nice opportunity for new teams to kind of get into the scene. And it's a really fun way for them to experience some competitive Splatoon that maybe they hadn't done so, so far. So this comes right off of yesterday's uh, Squid Spawning Ground 16, which had 47 teams registered. So that's a huge amount of teams to register for, you know, a, a, an upcoming tournament. Their Squid Spawning Grounds is also part of the Splatoon Amateur Circuit. So considering that all of these teams have, you know, to fall under a certain level of play based on, why is it leaving me right now? Um, SSQ, S mm -hmm. SQSS then they're kind of saying, okay, these are the teams that we're allowing to play. So it's, it's pretty awesome. It's going to be a lot of fun. And, you know, I'm really excited to get to cast this again. <laughs> so, and the last thing that I'm going to uh, mention for us today is Beacon. That's mm, like kind of, you go know, to Beacon. Go to Beacon, exclamation Beacon in chat. Make sure that you guys are registering. Late registration starts March 2nd. So we're like a week away, two weeks away, right? Yeah. So we're officially extending regular registration by one week. It was originally supposed to end this Friday. We're extending it into uh, the following Friday. So you, everyone has a little bit less than two weeks to register. Uh, registration shot up to above 70 people <clears throat> as of over the weekend. So there's a lot of people coming up. A lot of good teams are going to be there. Um, should be a really great time. It's going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, registration in general closes on March 15th. So you have a little less than a month to get those registrations in. We're going to have so much fun. Try to come for Friday. I'm planning some fun stuff. We'll figure it out. It'll be awesome. Mm -hmm. So, you know, super exciting. Anything mm -hmm. else that you guys wanted to touch upon or add for today? I got nothing, personally. Kermit? No, I think I'm good. What? <laughs> <laughs> any, any, anything you want to uh, promote? Shoutouts? Uh, I don't think I have a whole lot of anything like that. No, I mean, I'm not even, I'm not even trying to find Twitter followers, honestly. So. <laughs> um, right. I, 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 I got your Twitter up there. It's too late. I'm sure you got yeah, it. No, I'm thanks. sure you got one or two. <laughs> oh, dang. Uh, I'm gonna. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually, be... hang on. Hold up. Hold up. I do have to. I, I should a be thing. a good Australian and plug the Australian uh, mm. event, uh, Phantom, which is happening in. Oh right. Sydney yeah. in March, I believe. Um, so it's probably a bit late to book international flights out here if you haven't already done that. But um, yeah, that might be expensive. That's gonna be. That might be a bit expensive, um, and a bit short notice, but. At the same time, like uh, the Australian scene has been doing really, really well in terms of lands. Like surprisingly enough, even though our country is basically desert, um, with the occasional sort of settlement um, that we like to call cities, <laughs> um, the it, it's it's been really cool because like the each capital city just has like tons and tons of people, like and and it's not even it's not even like competitive players like there's tons of um lower rank players who just show up and have fun at lands like all the time and our scene is actually like has grown from lands rather than from online stuff um so like people people go to these lands because they'll like see something on facebook or whatever and they'll come onto the um they'll come to a land and then they'll be like oh hey like we can go onto this oceanic discord and and do that so that's um so yeah, like having an actual major event uh, out here in Australia is, it's a shame that it's in Sydney, but um, <laughs> it should have been in Melbourne. Be, um, yeah, but, Melbourne's awesome, but you know. But, um, but no, that's, the, I'm, I'm, I'm joking about that. The, the, but yeah, so like, it's, it's just really cool to see that we've finally got like a proper major event happening. Um, and uh, yeah, like it, I, I'm really hoping that like we can start to get some proper Australian like uh, a proper Australian competitive scene like properly built up so that we can start sending teams out to like big events in the states. Maybe probably not in Europe because I think Europe's a bit too far. But you know, like maybe we could get some a team out to G7 or something. Um, you know, like that's that's the sort of thing that I, that I'd really like to see. Um, but yeah, so. Phantom, uh, Phantom nineteen. Oh, it's, yeah, it's just Phantom nineteen. Uh, this link's being spanned in the chat, so that's uh, yeah, that's my shout out. That thing you're talking about with the litter litter lands is that could be a topic for next time. But 
that's the way to grow the scene right now fyi like every oh, yeah. was... every region across the planet like should be having stuff like that happen like make casual constantly. lands do it like make casual lands happen like beacon Gator would land. not be a thing if long island splat hadn't happened first like yes yeah, no, it, just just to sort oh, yeah, of preface that, Australia's, shout out Gatorland. Australia's like, you guys scene, should go to Australia's that. scene has grown so 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 much. Um, like the the competitive scene, uh, the, the the land scene rather in um, Brisbane, uh, in Queensland was like three people two years ago, and now it is like 50, 60 something. Yeah, um, actually, I think there's probably even more that, that show up to to these things. Like it grows super quick, and like a lot of these people who come in are like B ranks. And then, like, they get hooked on the competitive side of things and actually want to grind their way up and put the time in. And they're really, like, they're really... Um, that's uh, how you get them. Motivated to, like... Yeah. It's, like, that's... If you want to grow a scene, you get people who are not in your scene to come and join your scene. It's, you know, it, that's that's sort of what... And that's what Australia's been doing. Now we've got, like, hundreds and hundreds of, of players since Splatoon 2 launched. So it's just absolutely amazing. Um, Long yeah. Island Splat 2 was the reason I signed up for it, and then it was that following weekend that I reached out to Black about commentating. So yep. I would say that LI Splat is the reason I'm a commentator. And before LI Splat, like the first thing we did was like a social at Aeon. It was like it was like ten people that went to that, and we heard about it, and we were like, "Oh, cool!" And then we got involved and made Long Island Splat. So it's like. This is how it happens, guys. It's how it grows. Like, yeah. make your like every region should have this. Like, there should be one in the in mid Midwest, like Florida. Like, you know, the, these things should be happening more. And if totally. if you don't have one in your area, start it. That's that's yeah, my that, recommendation. That, wise words of the day for you guys. DJ, what you just mentioned, the thing about like there was an event that had like ten people, and then you guys heard about it afterwards. A lot of these events. There's only like, yeah, there's about 10 people at the first one. But that event taking place is enough to start getting people interested because it's like, yeah. oh, wow, something's actually happened. It's not like, just it people thinking about it. actually happened. Something. That means yeah. like, yeah. I can go it's to not, this. It's, like, not the, it's not the hashtag thinking about it stage of things. It is a thing that happened. Yep. It's going to like, there's reason to expect it to continue happening. Um, so, yeah, like if you like post an event in the middle of what seems like nowhere and like you get eight people or whatever and you're like oh my i might not want to do that again just like keep doing it and people will start taking note as long as, long mm -hmm. as you're like spreading spreading the word all that sort of stuff people will see it and will be will be interested yeah. so yeah awesome i gotta i i'll have to do this because if we don't someone so people will be upset. Can you can you talk about your thoughts about certain weapons and the current <laughs> current meta? FLC. Uh, you, sure. And like I mean, make it make it sweet. Make it like like you know five sentences. I don't uh, know if you can do that. <laughs> I know I, that's yeah, why that, that is that is that is that is optimistic. <laughs> what do you think uh, about Kensa Pro specifically? Is that a just a Japan meme or is it real? Uh, it's a bit weird. I think quick respawn, like people aren't using quick respawn properly anymore, which is kind of allowing those main power builds to like be strong again. Because like weakness of main power, same as spot one damage up builds, was that you didn't have any quick respawn, so it meant like if you died once, um, you could really easily snowball into losing, even if it felt like you had an advantage in the neutral side of things. And stuff like Kenzo Pro, Bamboo, all that sort of stuff should die off as soon as people remember that quick respawn Tetras and whatnot are just obscenely overpowered. So yeah. And that's my state. That's my one other thing. Uh, I heard I heard of this from from Day, who's who lives in Japan now. Is that apparently uh, neo splooshes are becoming a thing in Japan matchmaking? Sploosh, neo sploosh specifically. Neo sploosh. Yes, not not splash. Neo sploosh. What's that one? Beacon missiles. I think it's beacon missiles. Yeah. Uh, that's Why? really odd. I don't know. <laughs> that's, that, that's that's what Day said. He said he's been seeing a ton of them lately. Um, I think people might be just doing it for a meme because that Japan <laughs> is can't be real. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious because Japan does meme shit all the time. So okay, yeah, it's that's probably just a meme. You hear that, people that are watching Japanese streams? It's just a meme. Don't copy it. Yeah, <laughs> if you <laughs> don't start playing tournaments, someone, with someone that. mentioned Sorry. someone mentioned Kayatasu in chat. Yeah, if if Kayatasu was playing um, that weapon. 
I don't know what the hell build he was using. Kayatasu comes up with all sorts of weird things. He used, he I watched his stream once when he got to twenty seven hundred on spot zones by picking Kenzel Luna and doing nothing but throwing fizzy bombs at the zone the entire time. <laughs> so and he's, I think he's also the I, he's also the, the guy who like gave us the double um and no, not double uh, double dapples on Schellendorf. He's also mm. the guy who gave us the Tenebrella in general. So like it's sort of he just does all this sort of weird stuff that some of it works, some of it spectacularly fails. Um, so it works yeah, no, once. Yeah, you gotta like if you're gonna if you're gonna be watching Japan to try and like get clues on the meta, it's um, you gotta remember that Japan likes to cheese things in pretty much every game they do. Uh, like I think anyone who plays uh, Pokemon BGC, I hear from uh, uh, I think Gabe's still in the chat um, that Japan basically just plays hundred percent cheese the entire time in in, in that. Um, and like you look at splat zones at the moment. Every single team comp that Japan runs is just 100% cheese the hell out of the objective as much as possible, make it as obnoxious as possible to play against you, and then just sort of hope that you win your fights. Like, that's pretty much how Japan plays. So if this is some kind of new new Splat Zones cheese or something like that, then I guess maybe <laughs> it might be interesting to keep an eye on. But if you're trying to actually win video games, then don't... Don't just pick up whatever Japan does without thinking very carefully about what they're doing with it, um, because otherwise you end up with things like Charger H three, and that's just unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I that's one it. chat. That's one. Yeah. Actually, no, it's two. We yeah, mentioned H three versus uh, QR Tetris. Right? Oh, when he, uh, he didn't no, say. I was talking. Or was about, it? I was talking, I was talking was about Chargers? Chrome oh, Okay. Chrome right. Bendu is worse. Yeah. Right, one. Once. I almost settled for once. Yeah, I, I figured I should slip that in there, otherwise it'd be a riot and shit. <laughs> yeah, no, hey, no, just, everybody will just like constantly bombard our comments. Like, <laughs> I can't H believe it. HDD, HDD, I HCD. can't believe like like <clears throat> the funny thing. I don't. I literally, and the reason I keep bringing it up is because I like playing against H threes. It's fun. I just shoot them. And yeah, they die. you just like, move. It's the and easiest then, thing. It's just, it die, just yeah. feels so comfortable. Like it's the most comfy game. We'll turn another one. There's an H three on the other team. Now we're so, at yeah. twice. Yeah, there you go. Actually, it was three because you said it. Okay, sure. we're get, we're getting a little right, crazy right, now. Right, right, right. All right, three. three. And, and let's let's go. wrap this up. I before. think. Yeah. <laughs> My shout I out is that... this is happening <laughs> officially every other week at five p.m. on Sundays. Uh, yep. So catch us in two weeks. We got a couple big names that are interested in showing up, but I can't say them yet because they haven't actually committed. So hold out for that. Check our Twitter. You'll find out soon. Mm -hmm. For sure. Raji, you want to shout anything out? Speak it. Uh, you can follow me on Twitch. Here? 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 No, that's, that's Twitter. Sorry. That's Twitter. Wait, that's Twitter. You can follow me on Twitch at Dr. Prodigy, but abbreviated DR Prodigy. A lot of Splatoon. Um, yeah. Beacon. Go to Beacon. It's going to be great. Yeah. Beacon's going to be awesome. So... I think that's it for us. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Mem remember, we're going to be back not next Sunday, but the Sunday after that. So be sure to watch for that tweet and then post any questions you may have for us. Or if you have any topics you're looking forward to hearing us talk about. Oh, and, uh... and if you tuned in late, we're going to upload the whole thing to our YouTube tomorrow. So if you missed some stuff or you just want to watch it again, it's on, on our YouTube uh, at Game Set Match on YouTube, I think. Yeah, it's a game set match, YouTube. Yep. Yeah, but but when you actually go there, that's not quite the channel that shows up, so No spaces. I did that. Oh. Well it's well, what it we'll says figure for it me. Out. That's, that's weird because hang on. Let me get the exact link. I linked it earlier. And it worked fine. Yeah, and it has like a lot of random character letters. Um The URL must be different. Yeah, I think the URL either way it'll be on change. YouTube. We'll tweet it out. It will follow Twitter. Will. That's that's where you'll find it. Totally. So thank you guys again so much for joining us, and have a great rest of your night. Thanks for watching. <laughs>